What is up? What is good? How you living? How you doing? How you feeling? We are releasing this podcast on the beautiful day of March 9th, which means that later this week for the very first time, Connor Rogers and myself will be doing a draft prep breakdown. The name of the show is what, David Ingber? The NFL Draft Crash Course. And we are crashing into some courses. Uh, Very excited to get that going. I believe it's going to be about eight weeks as we get ready for the NFL draft. As I was informed yesterday, it is going to be around April 29th, uh, which thank God, because March, I am the busiest human in the history of humans. Um, Excited for that. Today, though, we are following NBA All-Star Weekend. If you haven't been paying attention recently to the explosion of non-fungible tokens in this world, from the art world to I saw Kings of Leon is releasing releasing an album strictly as an NFT. Uh, We are having people like Logan Paul releasing NFTs and selling out immediately. But in the NBA world, Top Shot has been the phrase on the tip of everybody's tongue. We've been talking about it for months, I would say, David Ingber. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes, you've been talking. I've been listening and giving you side eye. Uh, and clearly people are making money. Clearly this thing is huge. I continue to be skeptical. I own the fact that I'm very skeptical and I might be very wrong. It just feels like something that is so massive so quickly that I can't wrap my brain around it personally, but good for everyone else that's crushing it out there with it. The best part about this show, too, is if it continues to blow up uh, the market and continues to pull in <laughs> millions upon millions of dollars, you could just say that you're really selling a bit. You know yep. what I mean? This, that's your role on the show. It's just been a bit <laughs> the entire time. Um, I had uh, the opportunity a few months ago. It, it, by the way, Top Shot started in October, really with the beta. I had a, few, a chance a few months ago to meet Roham, uh, who is the founder of Top Shot. And I got to kind of zoom with him for about 30 minutes and just pick his brain about what is all of this. And it's the reason that I was a little bit more confident in this world. And I bothered him again and I hit him up on the DM and I said, can I please have you come on as now it's completely exploded and you have to be so excited. He was gracious enough to come on. We talked about how do they pick moments. I asked them with all of the excitement about this being a huge revenue stream in the NBA How are you going to make that happen? I even asked simply, how do you explain it to your friends? How do you explain it to your crypto friends? How do you explain it to your non-crypto friends? Uh, He was very kind with his time. He answered all of the questions. And here is my conversation with Roham. I hope you guys enjoy it. Hey, this is Blake Griffin, and I have a new show. Join me as I help people who are tired of being the victim of pranks get some sweet revenge on their pranksters. Catch Double Cross with, well, with me, Blake Griffin. Series premiere March 19th inside NCAA on True TV. I am sure that you are out there and you are seeing the movement right now in the world of NFTs and especially in the NBA. If you watch me on Tuesday nights, NBA on TNT, You may have seen the clip where I said, hey, Roham, put that on a top shot. Well, guess what? This is Roham, and the man founded Top Shot, founder of Dapper Labs, the creators of NBA Top Shot. He is the founder, I believe, of Flow Blockchain as well. Uh, Crypto Kitty is one of the original NFTs. Uh, Roham, first, I want to say I apologize for that, Roham because it should have been Roham, and I'm apologizing for saying Roham on TV. That was my bad. I'm sorry. Oh, not a problem. Not a problem. I... uh... I, uh, I love that. Love that shout out. So really appreciate it. Uh, can you also pronounce your last name for me? Because I want to get it correct. Gary Gozlu. Gary Gozlu. Yep. That's right. Amazing. Um, I had a chance to meet you and talk to you a few months ago as this was kind of all getting going. And I, I remember that you had a lot of excitement back then. And to think about how much Top Shot has become a mainstay in the NBA universe since we talked like two months ago. Is is tr- what what has it been like for you as everyone's trying to understand what it is and come to grips with it? This is your baby. So what what has this been like for you, man? Oh, it's been very cool. I mean, the uh, the, the coolest thing has just been you know how fast basketball culture has sort of adopted Top Shot and and 
you know, from from put it on a top shot to you know, uh, uh, players swapping top shots after games instead of swapping jerseys. To I mean, yesterday the NBA announced the Rising Stars as a pack in Top Shot instead of sort of doing it the way they normally do it. So it's just it's it's really really cool to see. And you know, obviously we're we're working hard on the uh, just making sure we can service everybody. You know, user base basically sort of 20x 30x over the past uh, month or so. So uh, it's a lot of work, but it feels good. Uh, just the way that I have tried to explain top shots to people is I think a lot of people will say it's a digital sports card is a, is a simpler way. I think for people to grasp rarity and opening packs and trading, collecting and all that. I think for a lot of people, uh, the, the topic of a non fungible token, the discussion of it being traded on the blockchain, I think it's, it truly is a generational gap between the two sides and, and their experience to it. When someone comes to you and goes, what is it? What is your, what's your elevator pitch? How do you explain it to people? I mean, I do explain it as digital trading cards um, because, you know, the, the users, the, the players that really get Top Shot are either already opening packs in video games, they're spending their time in digital worlds, and then they're just, they, they're feeling like they're missing something, right? Hey, I'm paying for these things, but I can't do anything with them. I can't sell them. I can't transfer them. And so Top Shot is just a very immediate jump. It's like, hey, pack opening, but it's better. It's the collections you're building, but it's better. You actually own the things you pay for. You can you can get real value out of them. And then on the flip side, um, trading card collectors are already so digital, right? Using products like Starstock, investing in products like Rally, and uh, already seeing their collections as more valuable when they are digitized because they don't have to worry about shipping back and forth. They don't have to worry mm -hmm. about you know, all of these things. And yet they're paying for custody, right? They're paying for uh, these kinds of things. They can't actually enjoy the cards because the visual is, is physical rather than digital. And so when they come to Top Shot and, and really explaining it doesn't do it justice. You just give them, you know, the phone and say, hey, click around, right? Open your first pack. And um, sure. it's harder now that, that packs are so hard to get. But uh, when people experience it, I think they get it much easier. I, the other night, I had a drink with Barkley, Charles Barkley. And he was like, Adam, did you see that somebody spent like a lot of money on a clip of LeBron? And I was like, hey, Charles, you want to hear something crazy? I actually was a small part of that. He goes, get out of here. He's like, so like you bought a video and it's, it's just a very interesting conversation to have because when we talked it clicked with me because I am a collector of cards. I'm a collectible of these tangible assets. I understand the value, the stored value. It makes sense to me. But you have to have people that don't even have a card background that are even more confused and I that maybe have a crypto background. So how would you explain it to somebody with, with experience in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and blockchain? Well, I mean, those folks, I feel like they, they get it. I mean, it's just like Bitcoin, the same technology, the same thing that makes it limited edition, the same thing that means you can uh, buy, sell, transfer it to anybody, the same thing where every single transaction is transparent on the blockchain for everybody to see. Um, that's, that's, you know, that applies to NBA Top Shots. It's just instead of currencies, they're trading cards and they're uh, things that are colorful and have pictures in them and, and you know, eventually sound and, and all these things, functionality in video games. So it's it's a much uh, easier jump when you already understand uh, digital scarcity from a Bitcoin context to say, well, it's like Bitcoin, but they're each individually unique and they have functionality and they can do different things. So um, mm -hmm. people people seem to get it. And, and, you know, we've got a lot of smart folks in our corner trying to explain the concept, you know, Mark Cuban and Gary Vaynerchuk and others and uh, and different people are, starting to get sort of their own, uh, their under, their own understanding of it. What was, um, so for people that don't know, uh, in the release of all NFTs and the history of NFTs, where was crypto kitties? I know it was towards the beginning. How early was crypto kitties? Crypto kitties was the first, um, NFT, the first formal NFT as in we wrote the the first non fungible token standard, um, which was the first real like, hey, this is what an NFT is. This is how you uh, make one, and this is how, if you're a wallet provider or a marketplace, this is how you accept it. This is how you transfer it. All these things. So until that point, all of the digital assets were what's known as fungible. They were either cryptocurrencies or they were sort of copies of the same thing. And there were a couple of experiments around um, digital assets that were non fungible. So CryptoPunks came before CryptoKitties. 
Um, there was these things called rare pepes that came before CryptoKitties, but they didn't have a standard that was that sort of defined and said, this is what these things are. Um, and so CryptoKitties was the first uh, uh, product to do that. Um, and and you know, it was really the first time we had also tried to make it more understandable to outsiders. So it's less of it's it's it was it was kind of a game, right? You you get two cats, they have their own unique genetic uh, uh, makeups. You breed them together, you get a new cat that has its own unique genetic mm. makeup. And you know the company doesn't control any of that. You control that, and so uh, people really liked it. But of course now it's just so expensive to even uh, use CryptoKitties because of the Ethereum network. So. Um, so sure. it was on Ethereum, December 2017. I'm just giving a background and now I'm going to bring it back to Top Shot. It gets so popular. I think one sold for like 117,000 USD at that time, uh, whatever that was in Ethereum at that time. Uh, and there were so many transactions that the Ethereum network kind of slowed down. And my question though for you as it revol revolves around Top Shot is CryptoKitties reached a little bit of a mania stage. And then it slowed down and a lot of the values went down, all that stuff. You clearly know how to build up excitement for a product. Like you've now done it. CryptoKitties was like, boom, slowing down the Ethereum network. Top shot. Like I'm seeing it on ESPN everywhere. I'm looking at Clubhouse and it's like every discussion. But what did you learn from the second part of that CryptoKitties story that, you, that as you were building Top Shot, you kept in the back of your mind? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the biggest reason CryptoKitties sort of stalled, and this is why we want to bring it to, and by the way, CryptoKitties had uh, a million bucks in trading volume just a couple of days ago. So people oh, are still- Let's just say this right now. CryptoKitties is probably going to make a huge comeback as the NFT boom is happening. But right. before the boom, yeah, you were going to go into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the thing was that CryptoKitties went from breeding- cats together went from costing fractions of a dollar and transferring cats went from costing fractions of a cent to, to, to basically hundred X that. And so the entire kind of game design broke because the game was intended to be, you know, a cent and it ended up being $10. And so the, 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 and we didn't have any ability to change that. So the smart contracts were uh, um, sort of open that we couldn't, we couldn't change them. And, the, the scarcity mechanics of the kitties are a little too complicated for people to really understand, oh, there's 49 of these, boom, it's over. Um, it's sort of, and so with Top Shot, we did two things. One is flow is much more scalable. We are doing, you know, as many transactions and as much volume in a day as we did in a year for crypto kitties. And so wow. it's, it's just the scale is, and it, we're not even stressing out the blockchain. It's the things that are getting stressed out are, you know, sneaker kids trying to bought our, our website and, and, and those normal things. So, so one was the scale. And then the other one is the game design. With Top Shot, when we close a season one uh, set or when we say, hey, there's only 49 of these, that's locked in the smart contract forever. No one has to worry about, hey, did, who has these genes and can breed more or how much does it cost to breed more? It's, it's not a, the scarcity mechanics are sort of uh, uh, defined and then fixed forever rather than CryptoKitties. You always had this idea of, well, anyone can make more cats. And so it was. It wasn't. Um, you know. You can't breed two trading cards together to create yeah, a yeah. trading card. And so it's just a much stronger kind of collector economy, um, as compared to you know crypto kitties. You need to be more of a. You need to sort of know all the specifics about the collector economy. So we're going to explain all of this, and and people are going to uh, like you said, crypto kitties is going to make a comeback. But Top Shot just is uh, much more accessible um, to to the mainstream. I think. Correct me on these numbers if I'm wrong, but this is just what I was watching as someone interested in the Top Shot marketplace. Uh, we're recording this first week of March. Towards the end of February, there was a Monday where I think you guys did $47 million in transactions. Um, you had a release that Tuesday in which 90,000 people were in line. You were going to have a rare pack release on Thursday. It had to be postponed uh, because you guys were fighting the bots and all that stuff. The next day, over 200,000 people were in line. So the demand is there. You're smiling ear to ear because it's this is what you dream of. You know what I mean? To have, but that's what, what is the. And I'm sure the revenue, because you guys launched in October, right? Like that's when it went, the beta went public. But what is the, what metrics are you using to explain people to where you are currently since it is changing so much so rapidly? Um, you mean to explain to customers where we are in sort of the last Yeah. Time? Or like when you're, if you're talking to the NBA and they're like, hey, what's, what, what are the numbers right now? How, how do you explain that? I mean, I think we, we're super early. I still consider us 0.1 because 
there's we're not even done with the features of the website, much less mm -hmm. you know the mobile app or, or other things. And so right now, just priority is on making sure the servers can scale, make sure we have security for everybody, make sure we're keeping people's transactions safe, um, and and kind of making sure we have the infrastructure where we can hundred x and thousand x from here. Because right now we're not trying to do marketing. I mean, I'm coming on these shows. Um, only when yeah. I'm sort of invited and, and, you know, just so you guys will invite me back when I want to come and, and, you know, pr promote and actually. Yeah. Be, you know? I bothered you. I DM'd you and I was like, man, I need you to come on right now. Um, wait, but to that, to that, what is, what is like, what did you guys do revenue this week in terms of like how much action is going on trading? How much money is being spent? So over the last seven days, uh, there's been about sixty-seven and a half million uh, dollars on the peer to peer marketplace. We get a 5% mm -hmm. transaction fee on that. Um, and then we've done the couple of pack drops that that you mentioned. So um, I think a million bucks uh, per drop, and you know those sell out within within minutes. So we're not really focused okay. on revenue. I, we're we're focused on right. kind of the customer experience, and um, and then try to sort of dial it on from there because the the money is here. People people are so interested in this uh, kind of economy and um, in top shots that uh, we need to think long term, not not kind of get. Uh, ahead of ourselves. It's about, it's about being around for a hundred years, not six good months. What's funny is, is Top Shot's so big right now that I'm like feeling the need to channel my inner Kara Swisher. Cause like having you on, I'd be like, I need to ask you these questions, but really I just want to be like, can I pick moments for you? But um, is it public the amount that the MBA gets a cut? Is that out there or no? No, it's not public. I mean, you know, we, um, but but they're uh, very happy with the arrangement. And I, th I th it's also important to say the Players Association is a partner. And so players also get um, a piece of every dollar that, that we make as well. Was it hard to get them on board? Or do you think that they were looking for this opportunity? I mean, a little bit of both. The um, It took a year, um, but but they were by far the most forward thinking, sophisticated group about this stuff. You know, they came with uh, lawyers that had knew what NFTs were, you know, back in 2018 and, and, you know, knew the dynamics in between. So we, you know, we knew that working with a big IP partner was going to be risky because we're a startup. We're going to need to make quick decisions. We need to ship, we need to move quickly. The technology is untested. Um, but they, they kind of gave us a lot of confidence. They were the right partner to work with. And mm. I think you're seeing that, that, you know, it's, it's, we couldn't have made a better choice, I think. Um, so, I saw the announce the fact that on your YouTube channel, you guys announced the rising stars rosters for the U S and world team. And the NBA chose to do that. Cause it's, you know, it's very purposeful while you're doing that. I saw a tweet, uh, in which somebody was like, Oh, so the NBA is looking at top shot, not just as a collector's item, but also as like a community building way to get the, the message out. Uh, how do you see, cause you're talking long-term. I have a feeling top shots are going to be more than just moment. Top shot is going to be more than just moments. What is your your long term vision for this? Because you're, I can see in your your gears are turning. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I um, I don't want to uh, give any surprises away, but but just look at the difference between physical uh, items and digital items when it comes to proving fandom, right? Like, if I'm the biggest fan of the NBA, you know, ten years ago, I would have piles and piles of these things at, at my house, and you know, or or you know, these um, you know, Larry Bird signed basketball, and, and sure. this this sort of thing. But then I show up to, the, to an arena. How does, how does the NBA know what I have and how, what skin in the game I have, what, how big of a collector I really am, how big of a fan I really am. And, you know, same thing in digital experiences, right? If I play FIFA every single day and then I show up to a soccer game, nobody knows that I'm a huge fan and I have the biggest ultimate team collection, etc. Whereas with Top Shot, because it's on the blockchain, anybody can read it. You know, you can go on dozens of third party sites right now and be able to say, Oh, Adam is a bit the fan of the, the Spurs or whatever. Right. Like, and he, he's a, he's a big collector in this. We need to, we need to treat him, treat him special. And so you can imagine teams building tools for that. You can imagine uh, individual. Um, Damn, it's so black mirror. Like, so like they would scan it and then it would be like, this is a super fan. Ooh, that would be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, it becomes your currency of fandom rather than just, you know, a, a collectible because you can carry it around everywhere with you. You can use it to access new, new products and services. Um, and again, is that going to be your line? Top shot, the currency of NBA fandom. We're playing around with different, it's different. Good. Yeah, it's good. That's good. That's good. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt the, you there, but you were, you were, you were talking and uh, it's, it is this, this, it, can you make a promise to me right now? 
You have to make a promise to me. I still love sports cards. And my one issue with the messaging about Top Shot has been, it's like sports cards, but better. And then mm. you list all the things that suck with sports cards. And mm. I believe that those two worlds can coexist. I and so too. that would be my one request is I am not a fan of the let's let's explain to people what Top Shot is by using sports cards and right. then crap on it. So that's my one request is to okay. not demean the hobby. Okay. Okay, you got it. We'll we'll try to find better ways. But you know what we've seen is it, people do get it when we explain it that way. But then they come into Top Shot and they actually get more interested in collecting physical things, not less interested, because it's you know it's it's all about oh wait this is cool I'm 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 getting re excited about uh, you know something I, I hadn't been excited about before. You know, so, but but I'll I'll um I'll do better. I appreciate that a lot. Because what I want to see is the parts of the hobby that I enjoy the most more prevalent in Top Shot. I see a lot of people with an investor mindset in Top Shot and those understanding if this is really the beginning of the NFT boom and this is going to end up being the first sports NFT and it's being executed at this well, I see a lot of investor mindset. I really would love to see more collectors in Top Shot where yep. people are not talking about when's the next drop, how rare is it going to be? They're talking and they're sharing true feelings about the moments and enjoying it. And so I think that's going to be a big challenge for you guys. How do you guys go about making it a collector's item and not just an investment opportunity? I, I think it's, um, I mean, I don't think the two things are necessarily in contradiction with each other. I think many, many people that, um, I mean, most of the people I interact with on Top Shot have, have, they might have even come because they were from the NFT world, et cetera, and then they become basketball fans. They get obsessed mm. with their moments. They get obsessed with the highlights. And, and the, the coolest thing I see is when I see players getting involved, you know, Josh Hart, you know, pl- opening a pack, getting a clip of him getting dunked on, and then sort of giving the backstory of that, of that moment, right? And so yeah. seeing, seeing, hearing more from players, hearing more from folks like yourself and, and Shaq and, and others and sort of using the moments as, as yeah, tell the backstory behind that moment in history in a way that people can hold on to. Like, that's what's cool about this, this thing. I talk about the Vince Carter three all the time. And, and, you know, just that, that moment has become sort of seared in my memory in a, in a way it would never would have been if it hadn't been sort of, if I didn't own it. Uh, and so I think that, that 100% you know what just made me realize right there. So much of the sports card world and a lot of collecting in general is about first. You know what I mean? It's let's get the rookie card. Let's get that RC logo. But in a way with Vince Carter, because you guys are starting in 2021, you have his ending card. Right. And, right. and okay, so this is me pitching you right now. This is called Lefko Shark Tank, okay. Lefko Tank. Everyone's obsessed with first. You guys could own last. And what I right. mean is the NBA, LeBron is nearing the end. Russell Westbrook, James Harden's around 30, Kevin Durant's around 30, Steph Curry, you guys are going to be the end of their careers. And you know what I don't remember about Kobe? His first game. But you know what I do remember about Kobe? That last game where he dropped 60. And so I'm just, I'm literally just spitballing right now. Everyone's about first, you guys can own last. Yeah, I, I think I think that's huge because it's also a guaranteed limited edition, right? Once someone stops playing, there's they will never make another highlight ever again, and so we can't make another contemporary. Okay, but you have to do it with me, and I would like it to be called the Lefko Last Pack, where we only send sell the last moment of a player's career. That would. I love it, but so I guess it's just a business proposal meeting. But but I gotta say the um the first moments are also pretty key because. Look, like let's say Lamelo um, becomes, you know, in ten years what LeBron is uh, today, and and then nobody really remembers what was LeBron's first, you know, major play. Well, Lamelo's was this assist that in Top Shot it wasn't. It's not actually as as a play. It's not the most impressive first play, but that player can go on to do amazing things, and it'll be kind of cool to say, well, you know, that you know that was his first Top Shot, and this I'm is. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a speaking point for your interviews. LeBron's true rookie card, his tops Chrome. It is a shot where you see Ben Wallace in the foreground. I believe it is a preseason game, and he bricked that shot. Now it looks great in a still frame, but it's a brick. So that would be my talking point for. Yeah, because I've heard people say the Lamelo. It's like a weird assist. It's not really an assist, but that that leads me to my next question. What is the creative process to picking moments? How do you guys do that? 
Yeah, that one's really interesting. I mean, the MBA is deeply involved. So we have uh, a few folks in their Secaucus offices that are picking the videos and uh, they're working with our team, of course, around like, you know, balancing the economy, making sure we, you know, rares, legendaries, pricing, uh, you know, quantity per player, this sort of thing. It's all defined in our in our sort of scarcity system and, uh, you know, market data feeds into it, this sort of thing. But but they're the ones that are actually, you know, hey, it should start at this second and at this second camera angles, all this stuff. And, and I think they're getting into it more and more, too. I mean, to be honest, in beta, we've been doing this. It's a new thing process for both of us right like they're not usually this deeply involved with a you know random startup and 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 start you know creating assets like this for us um uh, but we're 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 kind of getting in a good flow and i can't wait till we start putting you know exclusive camera angles or like you know the spider cam footage or um mm. when we have the app you'll Phantom be able to cam slow motion exactly, exactly. Um, you know, scrubbable videos where you can actually hold your finger, kind of go through it, slow motion, th these these sorts of things. Um, that's all. That's all easy, and it's all coming. And remember, each top shot, it's not a YouTube video. It's a Unity uh, sort of three D object with a video in it. And so, when you have VR, AR, all of this stuff, you able to hold your top shot in your hand, click it, open it up, throw it on your wall. All of that stuff is like built into the file format. It's not created yet but that's the whole beauty of digital right you're not that was gonna be my next question the the world the digital the physical world um how much of your guys time is figuring out when we are able to display in the physical world how are we going to do it how much time are you guys spending on that i think we just put the foundation in place right like and by working with unity it's a file format that can uh extend to no matter you know it, unity already works in vr it already works in ar yeah. Um, so it's not a huge priority for us right now, just because the number of people that have these devices, you know, it's it's too few right now. Right. But, you know, Apple Glasses is coming out soon and the Oculus, the new Oculus Quest is fantastic. And so over time, this is going to be more and more uh, prevalent. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think the next one would be, though, just like beam it to your TV and sort of, you know, show others what your collection looks like and be able to sort of swipe through it. I think that, that'll be a cool um, sort of activity that many people will get because everyone's got a TV. Why do you think, if we we're going to go at 30,000 feet, why are NFTs booming now? I think a big part of it, so we talked about this last night um, in, in the clubhouse with, and Chris Dixon's point was infrastructure, and I agree with him. You know, three years ago, we had a boom in NFTs, but it, ha it, it got stalled because there was no infrastructure. It cost too much to use the networks. Nothing really scaled. There were no wallets. It was really hard to get crypto. Um, we've sort of solved a lot of those issues um, I mean, with Flow blockchain in, in our case, and then on Ethereum, there's also different kinds of scalability solutions, you know, people doing off-chain things, you know, credit cards, uh, whatever it is. So I think a big part is like the boring stuff. It's just infrastructure that wasn't there before. Um, and, and that's what sort of took, took off. Um, and then the other piece is community. You know, three years ago when we did CryptoKitties, people came and said, you did what? Cats on a blockchain? Mm. What is an NFT? Whereas now when people come from, from Top Shot, there's actually, you know, a group of 10,000 people that get NFTs. And so they explain to them, no, this is how it works. You know, it's like Bitcoin, but it's, but it's you know, you can, you can add new functionality to it. It's secure on the blockchain. You can sell it on these marketplaces. There's a little bit more of a sort of core group for the millions of people, newcomers to sort of ask questions to and, and, uh, and, uh, and understand a little bit better, which is really interesting to see. We're up against it. I have one question. It's kind of a big one. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a quote. Okay. Rohan, you've been amazing. I love talking to you. It's a quote from Mark Cuban. NFTs in general, of which Top Shot is the first and a leader, could turn into a top three revenue source for the NBA over the next 10 years. I read that. I took a freaking screenshot of it because I was like, wow. My question to you is, How? Well, I mean, I think um, Top Shot is itself on track to create real revenue for for the NBA at a at a at a scale that matter will matter to them this year, and so that's that's already a great start. And on the other side, I mean, you, NFTs are just unique digital assets. So whether it's you know bobbleheads or or uh, you know we, with genies, we can put Funko Pop style um, uh, you know um, collectibles on blockchain digital fashion. Um, that, that, you know, you can buy your, you know, limited edition Luca jersey, put it on your avatar, all of these things. Um, and then you can think beyond just collectibles, right? Like you can think of tickets, right? Why, why should tickets be these um, live on Ticketmaster where the NBA themselves are sort of 
I don't own my customer. And then the customer is like, well, I don't have anything from going to this game. Why not get something from going to the game? Why not, if you have 10 of those things, get a new thing? Um, why not get have those things give you access to new things? Like, you know, you're a, you're a frequent game goer. The, the hot dog store across from the, from the arena could give you special benefits because all this stuff is transparent and public and on a blockchain. So this paradigm shift hasn't happened. Mark really gets it. Um, but, but it's, you know, in a year or two, you'll start seeing, you know, what, what like an open network can, can really do, uh, at scale. You are, you are truly turning the world, you're gamifying the world and you're turning us all into our NBA 2K, my player, as we walk around the streets, uh, I am excited for you because I know that you are the thing that I like about you were home is you're going in with, with good intentions. And so I'm excited to see what you're going to build. Uh, congratulations on anything. Is there anything else that you either want to ask me uh, or a sign off just to all the top shotters out there? Are they called top shotters? No? Top shotters, top shooters. You know, we're, okay. we're the top shot nation. We're all, uh, we're all inclusive for sure. And no, I mean, the main thing is just we're, we're just getting started. Uh, and uh, and you know, great to have you in our corner and you know, we want to we wanna make this big for, for all basketball fans. I think it's still uh, insider days and it's still it's still early days. So any feedback you have for us, any feedback anybody has, we're, we're all ears and uh, we're in this for the long haul. Roham, you can find him on Twitter. I believe it's at Roham G. That's right. Awesome. You're the man, dude. Thanks again. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. Again, if you'd like to follow him on Twitter, it is at Roham G. Uh, I thought one great guy. I know that you came away from that conversation impressed with him. Did it do anything to explain it as, I don't want to say cynic, as, as a, as a uh, more critical observer? Were you able to, to glean any more information or have you already kind of heard all of this already and it, you still are kind of keeping it at a distance? Uh, I think it's one of those things where the the bigger the numbers get, the less my brain can even process them. When someone says, hey, this thing cost $250,000. Hey, we did $50 million in sale. Hey, we did this many you know users, this many cards got sold. Like once the numbers get so big, I'm like, I get it. They're big, but they don't actually do anything for me, whether they're 1 million or 100 million. I, I get that it's very big. I loved listening to him. I think he's such an interesting guy and clearly such a bright guy and a, a true visionary uh, in, in the, the digital age for, for 2021 was, and beyond. I was taken aback at his vision of turning this digital world into real world benefits, mm. becoming almost- That the, actually, that was the most eye-opening moment that I was like, oh, I didn't even think, that's interesting. Like, yeah, but when you mentioned Black Mirror, that was, that was I'm always going to perk well, up on a Black Mirror a reference. Black Mirror episode where you walk around and it's like, you have a high rating. I'd rather deal with you. And it's, right. you know- it, it also makes you realize, at least it did for me, you know, we had a time before where it's like, how, how many Twitter followers you got? Oh, mm -hmm. that guy has uh, 200,000 Instagram followers. Oh, he's a big deal. And now it, in his world, he's going, look at his top shot rating. You know what I mean? Oh, that's a super fan right now. And so that that is is very interesting. It's a hundred percent Black Mirror ish, but Black Mirror always ends up, you know, showing the the faults of technology and all that. But it really reminded um, me of high school, though, like the idea that you know th this guy Tim, Tim in high school, he was the biggest Red Sox fan. Everyone knew that Tim was the biggest Red Sox fan. How did you know that? Well, because he had a hundred jerseys and he had ten thousand cards and he had every single piece of memorabilia and every pennant and every everything that you could possibly. He just owned it all. And when you went to his room, it was Red Sox for days. I didn't have that much stuff, so people didn't know I was that big of a Red Sox fan. There are different ways of expressing your fandom, and this would be a, a very interesting one with a lot of applications. A hundred percent. It. It's one of those things too, where it's it's funny today that to be a to be a company, it has to be more than just a product. And they clearly look at the the top shot moments um, as something that that is growing a community right now. And there's clearly a lot of commerce, but you can also tell that they see it as a world for NBA fandom. And I think it's 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 very cool to hear that because what an exciting time to be part of a company, you know where the, the possibilities are endless uh, and there's clearly demand. But um, I really want to hear more of your negativism, negativism, <laughs> your negativity, and not because, because I think it's very important to not just ask yourself, 
why can this be great? But also, what will prevent it from being great? I think it's important not to get too caught up in hype. And so that's why I really appreciate when you go, hey, all that sounded cool, but what about this? And by the way, that's what every CEO who is worth their salt is going to say. They're not going to surround themselves with a bunch of people that go, oh, top shot forever. This is going to make us a trillion dollars. We're done. No, they want people in the room that are going to say, eh, I'm not really sure if this is going to go the right way. Or what if we tried this? Or is this going to backfire on us? They want those questions being asked. Yeah. Did you have any other uh, counterpoints that you wanted to get in after listening? Because I really want to do both sides uh, of it. Um, the idea of opening a pack and getting really disappointed that you didn't get a star is something that they're probably, I know that like, I, I've heard little things about like the back end of opening packs in something like 2K where they really try to throw you a bone once in a while and they, they, they try to make sure that you don't open a million packs and not get a single star. I don't know how that's gonna work in the Top Shot yeah. world, um, but imagine waiting for three weeks to get your pack or maybe it'll, you have to wait six months and then you open it up and it's three guys that are gonna be you know 12th man coming off the bench. Is that gonna make you excited to continue doing it? I don't know. Yeah, that's sports cards also. Because what's yeah. going to happen too is people are going to be posting on YouTube because that's 100% going to become uh, a way of becoming a personality in the top shot space is being a pack opener. Yeah. Whether it's getting a lot of packs and opening them for people and being entertaining in the process. Um, but the amount of packs that I've seen open of sports cards where you get done and you're like, that was brutal. But <laughs> you hit the one and even if it's not your pack, you feel that dopamine kind of oh, sure. through them. So it's yeah. that's 100% something. By the way, what you just said about thinking differently, next week, next Tuesday's podcast is going to be with Adam Grant, uh, the author of the book, Think Again. He wrote a book uh, last year that I talked about a lot called Originals, uh, which gave me ideas like, child prodigies rarely do anything meaningful in the world because their brains are more about memorization and not about activation. Uh, he is a the youngest tenured professor in the history of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and his book right now is called Think Again. And really what it's about is how can you be flexible with your own opinions and how important it is to be able to change your mind and in this current world where we are broken down into often two groups, whether it's in politics and red versus blue, uh, look, people have it, whether you should be wearing a mask or not. But he started writing in his book a little bit about sports fans. And he also wrote in there about how he used to collect cards and carry a Beckett mag. And I was like, oh, I am fascinated to hear that kind of mindset shifting to those kind of worlds. Um, so I'm very excited to have him on. We're going to talk about uh, the preacher mentality of something like Top Shot and how to balance your mindset. But I also want to talk to him about what he's learned about sports fans in general, because I think Ingber and I have been taking a look the last few months about w that identity of being a fan and how it is ingrained into your brain. And is there a more healthy way to approach it? Not saying you're doing anything wrong right now. I'm just saying the, everything is malleable. Everything is changeable. So I'm, I'm excited for that conversation. Ingber. It's funny that you said everything's malleable and changeable. You might even say that they are fungible. Oh, <laughs> I like my tokens, non fungible, please. Uh, <laughs> For David Ingber. Hey, it, I read this thing that every adult that wants to be vaccinated is going to be able to get vaccinated by the end of May. Just hang in there. We're getting close to the end. Continue wearing your masks. We're so close. Like now is not the time to give up because it's been so long. I know that a year is like a very finite amount of time. And we say like, oh my God, it's been a year. I just want to give up. Please, I'm just imploring you out there. Be safe. And uh, let's get through this these last few months together. Especially as the weather gets nicer. Oh, really yeah. Tough, you know? Go outside for sure. Be safe, but go outside. And uh, I will end uh, with um, you don't have control over anything else in your world. The only thing you have control over is your reaction to it. And so the world that you make is the world that you create. 
The more good energy you put out, I know sometimes it's like, this sucks. The more good energy you put out, the more good energy is going to come back in. Keep thinking those positive thoughts. Keep living the good life. Appreciate you guys. For David Ingber, I am the L-E-F-K-O-E man. Thanks again to Rohan for coming on. And we will see you guys with Connor Rogers later this week. Hello, hello, peace.